super, super, super happy, privileged, excited to have you here. It's good to have something in person after all these months of Zoom and Teams and all these platforms. I'm glad to actually be in a physical space after a while. Absolutely. It feels different, but it feels good, right? So whilst it feels good, let's maintain COVID protocols. COVID is real, right? <laughs> and um, so today we're really, really happy to have you. And tell us, Zach, um, a little bit about your background. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah, so I've been in South Africa for about just over 11 years. In fact, my first day here was um, the 1st of May 2010. I was here to watch the World Cup, and I just, I, I, I just missed my flight, and uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't <laughs> gone back. That, that is actually partly true. Um, so I, um, I'm of mixed heritage. My mom's um, of Iranian descent. My dad's of Indian descent. And I grew up in a small town called Muscat in Oman, Middle East. I'm not sure many of you have been there, but it's a beautiful part of <coughs> the world. I spent 16 years of my life in, um, in uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by, by degree. I went to a very geeky university called the IIT. It's the school that Satya Nadella from Microsoft and Sundar Pichai from Google went to. So it's a very nerdy school. I did not fit in at all, but I somehow graduated. So it's a lesson to say, you know, GPAs don't matter, it's about what you do with that education. Then I had the, the balls, if I can use that term, to apply to Stanford grad school at the age of 21, which is something you shouldn't do. Don't take my advice. <laughs> don't apply to grad school when you're that young. But I had this incredible application that I wrote. I quoted Pink Floyd and <laughs> Carl Jung in my essay, and I think wow. they were just so shocked that this 21-year-old kid wants to apply to business school, but it's such an off-the-field, left-field application. I somehow got in, so. Um, and yeah, Stanford was one of the most incredible experiences ever. I was there in 2003 and 2004, right when the, the Silicon Valley sort of boom and bust happened, and just being in the presence of exceptionally innovative, smart human beings was it's, you know, to be, and, 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 and to think of the, the amount of innovation coming out of a 25 mile radius of the Bay Area that people depend on for everything from e-commerce to logistics to music to food to education, everything coming out of that small radius. And those two years that I spent there were a huge inspiration to, to build similar ecosystems across the world. There's nothing in the air or soil of Silicon Valley that makes it the sort of holy grail of innovation. So um, one of the things that led me to come to South Africa 16 years later was the fact that you have to absorb what makes these ecosystems work and what are the, what are the, the four or five factors that makes cities like, like San Francisco or cities like Tel Aviv or Mumbai or Bangalore or Beijing, centers of innovation. And when you're a founder and you want to build companies, what do you take into account before you even start building? Right, so, yeah, so that, I was there for a couple of years. Yeah. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Stanford is an expensive school. <laughs> it's not cheap. So a couple of hundred thousand dollars later, what do you do? Do you, do you want to be in debt for 25 years? Or do you want to pay it off in three years? So I'm a complete hippie at heart, as you can see from the way I look. Um, so I didn't want to sell my soul, but I had to. So I went and worked on Wall Street for about seven years um, at a bank called Lehman Brothers that everyone now hates. <laughs> so I was at Lehman for... So you're saying that you didn't want to sell your soul and then you went to Lehman Brothers? <laughs> yeah, so either you sell your soul and you pay off your student loans in two years, or yeah. you don't sell your soul and you're in debt for 20 years. So Fantastic. Choose. Right? Yeah. That's entrepreneurial. Right. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta sometimes, you can't always follow your heart, right? So you sometimes have to, it's your head, heart, and your soul. Yeah. And you gotta make decisions in life that sometimes aren't in perfect sync. Yeah. And you hope that as you get older and hopefully wiser, yeah. those decisions make sense. There's, um, there's in fact a quote that I start a lot of my talks on. Um, it's by a prominent Silicon Valley venture capitalist called Randy Commissar. 
and he said, of all the risks that we have in this world, the most dangerous risk is the risk of not doing what you want on the bet that you can buy yourself the freedom to do it later. It's such a powerful quote. I heard that 16 years ago. And it's, yeah. So the question is, you can't always follow your passion. People, you know, you have these incredibly motivation, you know, motivation speakers that talk about follow your dreams, follow your passion, blah, 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 blah. But there's also the other side where you have to pay your bills. You have to be pragmatic. Yeah. So Absolutely. life is a constant ebb and flow between following what you really want to do versus what you can do. And ultimately, you have to make those two worlds meet at some point. That's, that's, that's brilliant. I think I, I really like that. And I know from what you're saying that you have that small space that produces a lot of talent, a lot of companies, a lot of the big companies have just come from a specific region. So. I, I didn't attend Stanford. The closest I got was like just walking the campus a few times. You know, <laughs> it's a great and campus. It's a beautiful campus. It's yeah. a beautiful campus and the chapel, like that ceiling, like wow. But I would get married at the Stanford Chapel just to get married, and then I'd just like annul the marriage after that because <laughs> the church is so beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> but uh, what's interesting is maybe I can spend a few minutes talking about what makes Silicon Valley so special and how Silicon Valley has been replicated in other cities, not countries, but cities across the world. And it's very important as founders for you to understand if, if your idea or your product or your service is not working out in a particular city, how do I scale, how do I move to different cities or regions that where, where I can get traction? So I'm gonna bring it down to about five major things. Usually I have presentation this, but I'll talk off the cuff. Um, the first thing, and I can share slides with yeah. this later, um, if it's easier. By all means, yeah. So the first thing is you gotta, if you're an entrepreneur looking to, to start a startup, it doesn't have to be tech, it could be tech enabled. Um, you have to be in a place that has a strong um, prevalence of developers, designers, people in digital marketing, in advertising, and sales, right? You have to be in an ecosystem where that is part of the pervasive culture. Um, and within countries, you have microcosms where that exists and it doesn't exist. So if you look at, for example, the US, San Francisco tends to be a microcosm for innovation, whereas New York is not, right? Cape Town tends to be a microcosm for innovation, tech-driven innovation, Joburg is not. Tel Aviv versus Jerusalem, Bangalore versus Bombay, B Beijing versus Shanghai. So, um, e and, and even within African countries, um, Lagos versus Abuja, Nairobi versus Mombasa. So you gotta understand, where do I have the closest proximity to people that can help me in things that I cannot do? So most founders tend to be big, picture thinkers, visionaries. You think about your market size, you think about margins, about how do I acquire customers, how do I grow my vision. But you also need tech people, you need people that are designers, you need people that are sales staff, you need people that understand HR. So you have to start at a place where that ecosystem exists. And some of the biggest ecosystems in the world are obviously Silicon Valley, London, Berlin, um, Bangalore in India, Beijing in China, Rio in, in South America. So figure out where that ecosystem exists, right? Super important. The second thing, and often overlooked, is the, the amount of risk capital available in a region, right? I use the word risk capital and not capital. Um, often the attitude towards capital is a lot more important than just capital. So if you look at South Africa, I've lived here for 11 years now, and what I've realized over the last few years is, although there is a lot of capital in South Africa, there's a negligible amount of risk capital. I spoke about this, about it this, um, this morning with um, a couple of friends of mine who I had breakfast with. For whatever reasons, I'm not gonna get into politics or whatever, but the reality is the attitude towards capital in South Africa has always been capital preservation 
versus capital creation, right? So if you have capital, if you have wealth, your first reaction is, how do I protect it? How do I defend against it being used, stolen, lost, whatever? And if you look at the historical wealth of not just South Africa, but a lot of emerging markets, Nigeria, Ghana, India, Latin America, it's, it's about capital preservation. So your inherent attitude towards capital is risk averse, right? Now, that doesn't create a fundamentally solid ecosystem. If you look at, for example, many economies in, in Asia where capital, the, the, the attitude towards capital is inherently risk averse, you can't create wealth. If you look at Silicon Valley, the wealthiest um, class of individuals in the last 10 years are folks between the ages of 25 and 40, all coming out of the valley, right? Versus in South Africa, the wealthiest class are elder males between the age of 60 and 80, right? Now, nothing wrong with that, but the attitude towards risk is very different. So you will, and, and trust me, I've had the, the good fortune or bad fortune, whichever way you want to look at it. Again, this is not a political discussion. I've had, a, have had the opportunity to sit literally across the road from people like Whitey Basson, Kuis Becker, Marcus Juster, Christo Vise, all these people, because they're all intellectually curious about innovation, about venture capital, angel investing, but their actions don't mirror what they say, right? So it's the attitude towards risk. Stellenbosch is one of the wealthiest regions in the world per capita. Very wealthy region, very little number of people. So per capita, the wealth of Stellenbosch is higher than New York, higher than even Monaco, right? True story. But the attitude towards risk is almost zero, right? So you're happy with getting 10%, 12% on your money, be it property, be it the JSC, and that's okay, but you will never create wealth, you will preserve wealth. And that's why certain cities and economies will forever stagnate and others will improve, right? South Korea is a fantastic example of that. Anyway, so when you start a business, look, of, look at the attitude towards risk around you and accordingly position who you speak to, right? As an entrepreneur, you have limited time resources. You don't want to be barking down the wrong tree when you have so little time. So understand the attitude to risk um, before. And that will translate into other things that I'll cover later about where is the right person, uh, the right jurisdiction to house your IP, right? Where, I mean, there, I, can, I, I can literally speak about this for hours, but I'll cut it short. Number three, you want to look at things like um, uh, you know, what is the prevalence of accelerators, incubators, and startup support organizations to you as an entrepreneur, right? Now, a lot of you here probably think of the words incubation, acceleration, co-working spaces, networking events as the same thing. They're very, very, very different, right? An accelerator is, have you guys heard of Y Combinator, Techstar, Startup Bootcamp? These are world-class accelerators that take you from a post-prototype idea into a rocket ship within three to six months. It's because what you as the entrepreneur bring is product, technology, and IP, and everything else, you have the universe that sounds very hippie-like, so I lived in Komiki for six years, so excuse my hippie references. The universe will conspire deliberately to help you. So you've got an incredible product that, let's say, allows people to do cashless payments via QR codes. Cool. I'll get you the best IP lawyers, the best marketing people, the best CRM folks, the best growth hackers to help you in exchange for a small stake in your business. That's how accelerators work. We'll give you money. We'll give you resources. And more importantly, and from an African context, we will hook you up with distribution channels. That is one of the, and that's the fourth point, how do corporates work with startups, right? So in, in mature ecosystems like Silicon Valley, Berlin, London, et cetera, B2C business models, which is essentially business to consumer business models, where I'm selling a product or a service to a consumer work exceptionally well, right? So if you look at the, the most valued technology startups in the West, Facebook, Amazon, Google, blah, 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 they're all B2C business models. Right? In Africa, 
in India, China, in Southeast Asia, for the most part in Latin America, B2C business models do not work that well. Why do you think? Any thoughts? Sure. Yep. That's a very good reason. Yeah, but there were a couple of reasons, but that's a, a, that's a very important one. The purchasing power of consumers. Yep. And what else? Yeah, similar. Yeah. Purchasing power of consumers. Yeah. Oh, how do you physically? Pay? Yeah, true. Payment systems, which is also ironically why fintech in Africa has boomed in the last five years, because that's a clear pain point. But outside of just purchasing power, which is super important, the point before that is how do you acquire customers? Like if South Africa has 50 million people and you want to attract 0.01% of them, how are you acquiring those people? Where do they live? How do they consume? What are their purchasing habits? You know, there are so many unknowns that make it almost exceptionally hard for you to acquire customers, right? What percentage of South Africans or Nigerians or Kenyans are online? What percentages are digitally active? So you can spend, I mean, when I talk to founders across Africa, the assumption is, hey, how do you acquire customers? Oh, I'm going to spend some money on Facebook and Instagram marketing. No, that's... That is a low-hanging fruit. There's TV, there's radio, there's digital, there's in-person, there's campaigns. There are so many ways, but digital marketing is one side of it, right? So the biggest bottleneck to growing a technology startup is the cost of acquiring customers, right? By far. And unfortunately, the venture capital industry in Africa is so backward. And I say this openly, I've made lots of enemies saying this, I don't fucking care, because it's the truth, and the truth hurts, is the concept, in fact, when people use the word venture, uh, the word venture capital and private equity in the same sentence, they should be shot. <laughs> because the two are so different. Mm. Unfortunately, private equity is the, is the concept of taking existing businesses, restructuring them, change management, so that they become more cash flow positive, they break even quicker, you lower their costs, and you get to a point of stable recurring revenue. That's what private equity is. Africa has a great private equity industry. It could be better, but it's pretty, pretty competitive. Because, because venture capital became suddenly a buzzword and a very cool thing to be part of seven or eight years ago, you had a whole bunch of private equity fund managers saying, hey, if I just do a lower check size, I can now call myself a VC. So they'll ask you questions, really dumbass questions like, hey, what year are you breaking even? What's your EBITDA in year two? Or like, tell me about your HR structure. And, and they say no to 90% of deals they look at. Yeah. And you have really good, foundationally strong technology startups or tech-enabled startups anywhere in Africa that get ignored, right? So unfortunately, the VC industry in South Africa and the rest of Africa, until quite recently, has been run by CAs and CFAs and accountants. Yeah. Nothing CAs, against them. CAs and lawyers. And, and never, lawyers. They never invest in anything. They don't, <laughs> they don't, right? Or they invest in the wrong things, right? They, oh, yeah. it's, it's this whole mindset of being capital preserving versus capital yeah. creating, right? Yeah. Whereas in the US and in certain parts of Western Europe and now increasingly India and China, right? The people that run VC funds are ex-entrepreneurs that have run businesses, either failed, run a second one, sold, failed. They understand how startups work. And they use that experience to now run funds, right? Or people that run accelerators or incubators. It's called venture building, which is helping startups work over a period of time. So financial engineering does not equal venture capital. It's quite the opposite, right? So that's one of the reasons why you have to understand as a founder, how do I not focus on EBITDA and break-evens and profitability, but rather how do I grow my customer base exponentially? And the reality in, in Africa, and to a large extent Asia and Latin America, is that B2B or B2B2C business models, where you lower the cost of distribution from day one is one of the only ways in which you can scale. If you look at 
the top 10 tech startups in the US and the top 10 st tech startups in Africa, the profiles of business models are like night and day. So give me an example of the t of top technology startups in Africa. Africa, not South Africa, but Africa. I mean, South Africa is part of Africa, but. The new is Flutterwave. Flutterwave, What's, what does Flutterwave do? Payments. B2B payments. Give me another one. Yoko. What does Yoko do? B2B payments. Yoko is actually not that, I mean, they're good. They're not, I wouldn't call them the top 10, but Sendi in Kenya, Twiga Foods in Kenya, Flutterwave in Nigeria, Swivel in Egypt, Fauri in Egypt, uh, M Pharma in Ghana, yeah, Jumo. Jumia. I mean, they're all B2B ventures. Or if it's B2C, they have a B2B2C element. So you got to understand early on who controls two things. Very simple, two, two Ds. Who controls distribution? Who controls data? Data is oil, right? So if, if I can access customer data as an investor, I've struck gold. I can either touch my nose this way or I can touch my nose this way, right? Unfortunately, in Africa, it's counterintuitive Touching your nose this way, you have to go through large corporates. And who are the four horsemen? I mean, the four horsemen in tech are Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Facebook. The four horsemen in Africa are insurance companies, banks, retailers, telcos. That's right. All right? I'll repeat it. Banks, insurance companies, retailers, and telcos. And it just so happens that there are, there's, I wouldn't call it a monopoly, but there's sort of an oligopoly. Come on, let's be honest, right? So it's Sunlum, MMI, Discovery, Hollard, or Mutual. Five. We are obsessed with the big five. The big five banks, Absurf, FNB, NetBank, Standard Bank, Capitec. Yeah. Is that a coincidence? Five? Yeah. And the, the big five retailers, Pick yeah. and Pay, ShopRite, Food Lovers, Woolies. I'm sure there's one more. Check, yeah, ShopRite yeah. checkers, but yeah. <laughs> so you have these oligopolies that control every industry. And it's not just a South African thing. The same thing is in, in, in Nigeria. It's just Access, Diamond, GT, EcoBank, and one more. So they control customer data. The telcos are even worse. The telcos rule East Africa. So as a founder, you've got to say, cool, if I have, but, the same, uh, but at the same token, these corporates are horribly inept at innovation. So if you're all mutual, I mean, I don't care if they're all mutual people in the room, but if you're all mutual, you're still expecting your brokers to sell insurance policies in briefcases and go you know, door to door. So you're horrible at innovation. You'll create these stupid projects. I spent 10 years of my life in corporate. You'll create these stupid projects, Project Orion, Project Alpha, with like a massive like, you know, budget associated. Oh, let's try and see what we can do with this blockchain shit. Yeah. And it, they just literally blow money. Yeah. But what corporates understand now as a startup is, hey, I've got a piece of technology. I understand my end consumers better because I'm a startup. To your point about Eric Ries and Steve Blank is I can fail forward, I can fail quickly. So can I offer a product or service to a large corporate anywhere in South Africa or Africa where I make the customer experience for their customers better? And I don't go to a corporate and say, hey, all mutual or M10, I want to steal your fucking customers. No. You say, hey, can I make your product offering better? Because I can do A, B, C, D, and E in a much more efficient way than you can because you have to have legal, compliance, regulatory, tax, blah, 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 to do a small change versus just use my tech. The key thing is to not own the end customer, which is so counterintuitive to the way human beings think. You want to own everything. What you really should be doing is let me license what I do to you. You keep all the power, all the glory. Bob's your uncle, but let me be your plumbers, right? It sounds so counterintuitive, but this is how unicorns are created, right? So because you know that in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, distribution is key and data is key. So if you're a retailer, so irrespective of how poor your end consumer is, everyone has some sort of a retail account, some sort of an insurance policy, even if it's just funeral insurance, Right? Everyone has a telco, often multiple telcos. Everyone has some sort of a banking product, even if it's a stock fell. 
right? That is data. So you have to understand whatever your business is as an entrepreneur, how do I work with the corporates? And you can either do it through a rev share, a licensing agreement, it's often called white label solutions where you build something for a corporate that they on sell to customers and you just charge them license fees. Mm. Right. You, you, you mentioned like a lot of great things and um, you absolutely, I totally agree with you in terms of in Africa, you start out B2C, then you struggle, then you go B2B, and, so, and still you're thinking of, I still one day I want to do B2C, and then it's going to be B2B to C, or you try to stick with B2C, and then you fail. You know? Or I've seen like massive pivots of companies um, here, lo I mean, in a lot of African countries. I mean, you can that. do B2C mm. once you have leverage. Yes, and so that, that corporate, getting corporate deals and same for us as startup circles like initially it was b2c and realizing like okay we're not taking off at the point that you i mean as fast as we would and then you get the big corporate saying hey we want to work with you and this like okay that's not what we had in mind but hey we we'll take the money <laughs> and then we we'll still offer them what they want and then still do the b2c and then getting them to sponsor some of the students now the question would be how can entrepreneurs here how can they get into B2B? Like if they are started out like B2C, what are the practical things they could do that would help? Yeah, I mean, so the good thing is a lot of corporates get involved in incubation programs and accelerator programs. And you've, I mean, this is, I mean, so I, I didn't even complete the whole story before this. So I'm one of the co-founders of Startup Bootcamp, which is one of the largest accelerators in the world. And we have taught entrepreneurs from Egypt, to South Africa and every major geography in between on how to pivot their thinking from a B2C model to a B2B2C model, right? And we then go, on the other hand, to the old mutuals, the Sunlums, and NetBanks, the MPNs of the world, and say, how can you be more innovative by partnering with these startups? So it's this, this concept of pivoting your business model to involve distribution channels is what accelerators and incubators and startup support organizations do. Um, and I'm gonna, f and it fundamentally boils down to the way, I mean, I was telling someone else this morning, 90% of success in entrepreneurial ventures worldwide boils down to human psychology, right? I mean, like, if I could go back and study, I would go and get a PhD in consumer psychology, in anthropology understanding the way human beings think is by far the biggest tool that the big tech companies in the world have. Yeah. I mean, just to, can I digress for like a minute? Go ahead. Just for a Go minute. Ahead. Go ahead. Everyone here knows that Amazon is the world's most valued company. It, it's either Amazon or Apple, but Amazon's right now at about 1.7, 1.6 trillion dollars, right? Amazon pays shit loads of money to cognitive psychologists. I bet you guys didn't know that. And they, tr and they go deep into the mind of how consumers think, right? I mean, to the extent that, did you, did, did you know, and please forgive me, I'm repeating this because you heard it this morning. Did you, did you know that about 65% of adult Americans have Amazon Prime? Amazon Prime is a, a service you sign up for. It costs about $100 a year, where you can get anything delivered anywhere in the US within 24 to 48 hours, right? It costs $100. Amazon usually makes a loss on this. It, it's, it's a loss leader. But what's the psychology behind why Amazon does? Amazon is one of the world's most valued companies in the history of the world, right? But they have understood consumer psychology better than anyone else on this planet, closely followed by Facebook and Google. So if you were to buy something on Amazon and it gets delivered to your house the next day, and for some reason you say, eh, I don't particularly like it, I'm gonna return it. So if you were a regular brick and mortar company, you'd have to, okay, take, me f uh, take photos of the product, fill out this claims form, mail it back, we will check if it's actually broken or if it's defective, and in seven to 10 business days, you'll get a replacement. That's typically how returns work, right? What does Amazon do? You guys know? 
fucking brilliant. They're like, you know what? It could be really broken, or you could be fooling us. We don't care. Complain, but hit a button on our app. Within 48 hours, you have another, let's say, you order wine glasses. Ah, another six set of wine glasses. You think you've gamed the system, but you as a human being are like, I got another set of six wine glasses, and I fooled Amazon. Does Amazon care? No. What have they done to you at that moment? They've given you a dopamine hit. <laughs> yeah. All right? Mm. And it's addictive. That's why 65% of Americans have Amazon Prime, and they pay $100 for it. 250 million people times $100. Work the math out. Mm. That's one of their core products, right? They understand consumer psychology so well, mm. right? So the key thing about running a tech startup is understanding how your end consumers think. And to a large extent, because you can't get that customer research because it's hard to get that in an emerging market, you do it through insurance companies, retailers, telcos, and that's how you, you create value, right? That's, how, that's why Flutterwave is valued at a billion dollars. I was, in, I was one of Flutterwave's first investors four years ago. But, so that's, that's the psychology. And, you, and, and, and the second part to that is understanding what matters for end users, right? So if you grew up in the 80s and 90s, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you lived then or you're older or younger than me. I turned 40 in a few months. The only two things that mattered for a startup or a small business or any business were two things, price and quality, right? So if you were the cheapest product on the market and you were barely functional, you could make a lot of sales, right? Or on the other extreme, you could be a bit more expensive, but your quality was insane. So you either so the, the price versus quality curve was fairly elastic, mm. right? In the 80s, 90s, and even part of the 2000s. And then something really big happened 10 to 11 years ago, right? It's the introduction of the, of the gig economy. So the sharing economy. There was so much digitization where people didn't want to own assets, they wanted to share assets. That's why you saw companies like Uber and Spotify and Netflix and the, the, the explosion of e-learning platforms, right? And then all of a sudden, you have these, I've got <laughs> these, these young millennials and the Gen Zs that have the attention span of a fucking housefly, right? <laughs> So do you think your end consumers of today really care about price or quality? They don't. What do they care about? Speed. They need efficiency, they need convenience. I want it now and I want it here, right? To the extent that if, if I get something so convenient, I'm less sensitive to price and I'm less sensitive to quality. And number two, Whatever I do, I want to save time because I don't have time in my day. My day is so busy. I mean, when's the last time any one of you guys here watched a 30-minute YouTube video yeah. between Monday and Friday in working hours that wasn't work-related? Seriously? <laughs> that wasn't work-related. Dude, I admire you, man. I hope you have a, quite a few zeros in your bank account at the end. <laughs> People don't have time. Yeah. So anything that saves people time and creates convenience in their life, you create value, right? So as a founder, instead of focusing, I have so many founders talk to me about what is the right price that I should price my product at? Or you know, should I focus on getting it to ISO 9001 standards or that standard, should I pay for this? You can spend time, but too few founders spend time being obsessed about their customers. Hmm. Instead, you obsess on your product. Your tech and product, yeah. And no one fucking cares. Yeah. I mean, Steve Blank, the famous Steve Blank that was on your show, show mm. program, said no one, no one ever asks for a six inch drill. Have yeah. you heard this story before? Yes. People say, let's say you wanna put, put a, a picture frame on your house and you call a handyman and you're like, hey, I want a six-inch hole so I can you know, put my picture. 
Do you say, I want a six inch drill? No, that's your fucking business. Figure out your drill. So you, you want a solution. How it's achieved is completely irrelevant. If I used a chisel and a hammer, Michelangelo style, so what? If I used just a, a, a mechanical drill, so what? The problem is a lot of founders care so much about their product and so little about their customer. So one of the only ways in which you change that mindset is you literally start to think like your customer, which very few people do, unfortunately. Yeah. And the moment you change that mindset, everything changes. So when I, when me and my team, when we interview founders, we ask them how much they know their customer. How big is your market? Who's buying? Why are they buying? What do they pay? The number of founders that do not know who their customers are is shocking. Absolutely shocking. And then they want money, right? And then they like want money. They're like, <laughs> are you fucking if, kidding me? If you give me money, everything will work. Yeah. No, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, there are so many pitfalls that founders make when they, when, when they look for capital. I mean, that's a whole nother talk about... The Tell us about those. Like, what are some of those pitfalls? Like, there are a lot of founders here at different stages, and they're raising, yeah. some are not raising, but they're trying to build great companies. What are the things that you look out for? And there are so many, but I'll give you, like, the top, the top three or the top four. Um, asking for someone... F so, first of all, this is quite obvious, but skin in the game, right? So, if you're a founder, and you haven't... <laughs> exhausted every source of capital you possibly can from yourself, from your friends, your family, your loved ones, to put into what you are doing, and you have the fucking balls to ask someone else for money, forget about it. I'm just gonna put it out. I curse a lot, so please edit this or don't. So, skin in the game. Super important, right? If you wouldn't mortgage your house to do what you're doing because you love it so much, why should I? As a case study, one of the startups that we invested in as an accelerator startup bootcamp two and a half years ago is a digital bank called Kuda, K-U-D-A, Kuda Bank. It's Nigeria's leading digital bank. So, I mean, I'm not sure if, if, if many of you here have lived in Europe. Are you familiar with N26? Oh, you're German, right? N26, yeah. Or Monzo in the UK. These are Revolut. I'm sure you've heard of Revolut. So, Kuda is the Revolut or the N26 of Africa, right? Kuda Bank was part of our accelerator two and a half years ago. The founder, Babs Ogundi, was just a regular bloke. I mean, on Friday afternoons, he shared Nando's chicken meals with us, and he was, you know, just a poor founder, but very smart founder. And the, the, um, where was I going with this? Fuck, I got carried away. I'm talking about... You're talking about skin in oh, the Oh, yes, yes, yes. Skin in the Little game. did we know that Babs name is, yeah, Babs, mortgaged his own house. He took a second mortgage on his house that he could put that money into work in his company. He believed so much in the future of digital banking that he says, I don't care. And that is fucking impressive because you know that you've got skin in the game. Fast forward a few years, that startup is now worth close to half a billion dollars. And he's got money from people like Peter Thiel, right? Co-founder of PayPal, Nigerian bloke in Lagos. Right? So that's so skin in the game is a no-brainer. When I have founders, and the second thing is founders that pay them ridiculous salaries. I'm sorry. You can't say, "Hey, I was at McKinsey two years ago and I made twenty thousand dollars a month." I'm like, "You're not at McKinsey anymore. So shut the fuck up." You're running your own company. Your reward is your equity, right? So the founder of Kuda Bank was paying himself $2,000 a month, barely enough, but he's worth more than $100 million today. So you earn in equity, if you believe. So that's number one rule is founders that don't have skin in the game, right? It's just, it's just a show of, and pay themselves too much, right? That's one. Number two is when you go and ask, and so assuming you've done that, you have skin in the game and you've exhausted friends and family and all of that, is not knowing why you're asking someone for money. Right, so the number of founders that have, that have pitched to us and 
other VC funds that say, okay, why are you raising capital? For what? And how long is your runway? What is your plan? So we're raising capital for operations or just to spend, right? <laughs> like every business needs money, right? <laughs> so rule of thumb, if you are raising money to finance assets, to buy machines, working capital, to buy space, to buy just assets, capex. Don't go to a VC, don't go to angels. Raise debt. Debt is the cheapest form of capital. To a lot of people it's counterintuitive, but debt is the cheapest form of capital, why? Because there is no recourse to pay it back. Sorry, there is no loss of earnings to you as the founder by taking on debt. So it's simple, old school accounting 101, asset liability matching. If I'm raising capital for a factor of production, which is an asset, I take a liability. A liability cancels out an asset. Literally, go back to high school. A equals L plus E. That's the liability of equity. Liability cancels out an asset. If you're raising money to build technology, to hire a team, to spend on marketing, raise equity. Nothing wrong with that. Because VCs and angels want to pay for one thing and one thing only. What is that? Growth. Nothing else. I don't fucking care how profitable you are. I want to see you go from 100 users this month to 250 users next month. So if you're using my money for marketing, for customer acquisition, to hiring shit-hot salespeople or marketing people or tech people to make your product incredible, I'll give you money. If, I'm hiring, if, if you want my money to build a factory or to build a warehouse or to buy a machine, no fucking way. There are, people that, there are other people that fund that. If you want to raise money for R&D, approach the government, approach TIA, approach the IDC, approach the NEF. There are hundreds of organizations that fund R&D, not VCs. So it's understanding what the use of your capital is. And if you're talking to a real VC fund, you can't fool us because we've seen hundreds of companies. So you can't say, hey, I need 100,000 Rand to do this. I'm like, no, it doesn't cost that much, right? So, so that's... That's, so know what the funding is used for. Number three, <laughs> which is probably the biggest fuck up that founders make, is they don't know who they're talking to. So by the way, as a rule of thumb, never spend any time, money, or resources writing a business plan. It's so 1980s say it or again. 1990s. Please say it again. Please do not spend any time, money, or even worse, pay consultants to write business plans for you. Please. Zach, somebody pitched us, like me, Lelimba, and Sarah, Jake, at Enigma Ventures last week. They were raising a million rand, and they said half a million rand was going to go to business plan writing. I was like, what? <laughs> so I had to ask, like, um, by the way, how much is the does it cost to write a business plan? He says, oh, we got three quotations. One quote was one million rand. Another one is <laughs> half a million. It says the cheapest was 250,000. Like, wow, maybe I should change my business. I should be writing business plans for a million dollars. No, there are people that make rand. a living out of it. So you're making lawyers wealthy, you're making consultants wealthy. Nothing, I mean, people need to you know, put food on the table, but you know, you're not a charity. So, so yeah, unless you're looking for traditional asset financing, then a business plan is great. But if you're looking for equity financing, you don't need business plans. You need a very short, succinct, 10 to 15 pitch deck. There are tons of resources out there. Just literally Google startup tech pitch decks. 15 pages max, product, market size, business model. It's just Google, right? Um, so knowing what your investors typically invest in. So if you're talking to an angel, slightly different to talking to a VC fund. Now, if you're talking to a VC fund, what should you keep in mind? A, do research on who they have invested in before. Most VC funds list their portfolio companies on their websites. If you don't know, find out, right? Talk to portfolio companies that have gotten money from that VC fund. Say, hey, I'm looking to approach Knife Capital. 
I know that you got invested from Knife Capital. Tell me about your experience. What is your management style? What's your investment style? Get information on how the VC fund invests. Understand what their strategy is, what they're looking for in return. So do enough research on your investor as they would do on you. The number of founders that completely treat all VCs the same, say, I need some fucking money, I'm broke. And they do the same pitch, they're like, you even prepared for this meeting. So knowing what your VC fund or the VC fund that you're pitching to does, you know what is very, very attractive? I had a founder approach us three weeks ago. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's like dating to a large extent. And they're like, oh, Zach, I know that you've got a portfolio of 30, 40 companies in your fund. I noticed that you invested in this debt collection company in Nigeria that does an AI channel to, to collect debt. And you've also invested in um, a company that does unsecured lending. Guess what? We do X, Y, Z, and we think we could help that company perform better by this. And, I'm, and my jaw goes from here to here. I'm like, what? You've done so much research on not just me as a fund, but our portfolio companies, and you've made the effort to even think about how you can benefit my portfolio companies. I love you. <laughs> that almost never happens. But if it does, it's a switch in your head. And what the biggest misconception that founders have of VCs is that they care about your numbers. I'm gonna tell you one thing now. I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> it has been quoted before. The only thing true about your financial projections is that it's false. <laughs> I've said this before several times. Yeah. And, and if you reverse engineer that, if you look at all successful tech startups today, and you go and look at their five-year projections five years ago, and if they are within a plus or minus 10% bandwidth, I will literally cut all my hair off, which to me is a big deal because I love long hair. Joking. The reality is people get it wrong all the time. People either vastly overstate their projections and they fall way short, and in certain rare cases, they understate it because you're too conservative. So no one reads financial models. They look at it to understand how your mind works. That's it. We don't believe even 5% of your financial model. It's all bullshit. Works of fiction. It is, it is a work of fiction, <laughs> right? We look to see, so when I ask you, hey, can I see your five-year projections? What am I looking at? Okay, how has this particular founder looked at her market size? Okay, she started with this city, this percentage penetration, these are the margins. Okay, so she's thinking that way. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, what about expansion to different products? Okay, so I'm looking at the way the logic works and how have they arrived at the total addressable market, how much they cover, what the margins are, you know, how much are you shrinking margins with more competition, blah, 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 blah. I'm looking at your sequential train of thought. That's it. I don't care what the numbers actually say. That's what VCs look for. They look at how your mind works. The numbers, it's like a blindfolded person throwing darts on a dartboard. Doesn't make sense, right? What really matters is at the early stage, if you're pre-Series A, no one cares about you, especially they think about how you think. So, and, and, the, and, and the next mistake, and I'll stop there with the pitfalls, is, and there are lots more, but these are some of them, is you walk into a VC's office or someone's office and you're asking for money and you overstate what you've achieved. A VC will normally ask you, okay, so you're raising a million dollars. Okay, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. I see you've got some traction. And you overstate two things. You overstate your clients and you overstate your investors, right? What people forget is that the VC industry in Africa and globally is yeah. pretty damn small. small yeah. So if you go and say, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm talking to Havaik, I'm talking to Enigma, I'm talking to Kalon, I'm talking to you know, E4E, I'm talking to this, and I've got a term sheet from this, and they've committed, you know, half a million, blah, 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 blah. What do I do, or what do other VCs do? Whilst you're talking, I take my phone, and I'm WhatsApping Clive. Hey, have you spoken to, to Justin from this company? Have you? Nope, never heard of him. 
or it's or it's you know an email. Yeah. I'm like, okay, Andrea, um, so and so is saying that you've got a term sheet. I replied saying I was interested. <laughs> so people, so literally during the meeting, I've already checked because my partner is talking Q and A. I'm checking. I'm like, for the VCs that you mentioned don't even know you, or they've replied in, a, in, in, in less than what you said. So just be honest. It's perfectly okay to speak the truth, right? That is, yeah, and then overstating clients, mm. right? So just be real, because we know how hard it is. Yeah. And then just have the, the, um, the pragmatism to really understand your market properly and dive deep into it before pitching to a VC. The reality is, let's say you're an ed tech company, right? Or someone mentioned that they were doing recruitment, a tech platform for recruitment. And I would ask you, what is your competition, right? I can tell you now, tech platforms for recruitment in South Africa alone, there are probably about 20 companies that do it in Cape Town alone. And if you don't know at least half of those, it just, it just augurs not so good. Because I'm like, why should I as an investor or my team know more about your industry than you do? And unfortunately, investors are at a slight advantage because they see lots of pitches. So it's, it, is, it is up to you and your, you are beholden as a founder to know your market better than anyone else. Because if you don't, who should? So these are all major pitfalls. And I can tell you now, the decision that a VC makes happens in the first 10 minutes of meeting you. And then people are too polite to say no. So they'll say, yeah, I'll get back to you and blah, 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 send me more information. And that's, a, and that's something that VCs should learn better, is I always say rather a quick no than a long no. So we do that a lot. If we really like someone, we have follow-up calls the following week. If we don't like someone, then literally the next day, well, oh, the, no, 48 hours, sorry, not a fit, because, and we always give reasons, mm. right? So those are some of the pitfalls that founders should just be aware of before they talk to Brilliant. VCs. Cool. A big hand for Zach, please.